Welcome to Georgia Military College Bio 105 Environmental Science. My name is Professor Mark Fairbrass and I'm going to be your professor for this entire quarter. So we're doing environmental studies as the class. Um, environmental studies and any other college would be called environmental science. Uh, the two names uh, are completely interchangeable. So um, the textbook is called environmental science so that's what we're going to start with. So we have to start our course, of course, by saying what is environmental science? Environmental science is a very broad topic. This does make it challenging. It includes chemistry, physics, sociology, psychology, as well as all the biology subjects. Now the environmental side of environmental science includes all of the aspects that affect a living thing during its lifetime. So for you it would be the air you breathe, the water that you drink, the water that grows the crops that you have to eat, um, your house, the type of climate you live in, whether it's hot or cold, wet or dry, all of the um, diseases that are around you, all of the chemicals that are in your life, the cleaning chemicals, the helpful chemicals like antibiotics, anything and everything that could influence your life, that's part of your environment. Now remember that it would also include other living things. So that leads to our core concept for the class, and that is interrelatedness. Everything is related to everything else. Um, one way to think about this is that the environment is a whole bunch of interconnected parts connected like uh, a spider web. There's lines going everywhere in the spider web connecting each thread to another thread. John Moore says that if you tug on any and all living things, you'll connect, find it connected to everything else in the universe. So if you were to tug on your spider web, um, you would find it connected to a bunch of things around your local house. An example of that is one right here in Milledgeville where Georgia Military College is. Um, people can drain water from a lake. They don't have to pay for that water to uh, water their grass. So it's the middle of summer here right now. It's incredibly hot. It's about 100 degrees today and some people are sucking water out of the local lake and spraying it onto their grass because we're in the drought. That is part of the interrelatedness. As they suck the water out of the lake, they don't want to interfere with the lake, they just want to get green grass. But by taking that water out, the amount of water in the lake goes down. And as the volume of water shrinks, the water will become warmer. Less water means there's less of a heat sink. So we've got more um, brown areas around the lake as the mud is exposed. That dark brown mud acts as a heat sink absorbing more heat. We have less water absorbing more heat. So the temperature of the lake will increase. In lakes as temperature goes up, the amount of oxygen goes down. So as the water warms up, its oxygen levels decrease. And when they hit a certain threshold, remember it's really hot here every summer, then the fish will just become stressed and the fish will breed less. Some fish may die. And you may have heard recently about a very large fish kill over in the US where a section of the river in Georgia um, had a couple of thousand fish just die from overheating. Uh, that section there got very, very little water in it, heated up extremely high and the fish died from lack of oxygen. So we can see our interconnectedness from the man watering his grass is actually decreasing the number of fish in the lake so he may be one of the world's you know premier fishers he may be part of the bass pro tour and by watering his grass he's actually decreasing the number of fish that he's hoping to catch on the weekend just a very uh, simple way of looking at this interconnectedness All right so we've been using this term ecosystem and we definitely need to know what an ecosystem is. So ecosystems are regions of the environment that are very, very similar. So an ecosystem could be Lake Sinclair, a local lake, and obviously there's many, many lakes around the world, they're similar ecosystems. Um, but it's not just the lake itself, it's the physical environment of that lake and all the biological things that live in it. So we've got the physical environment, um, how much water, what's the water temperature, what's the pH of the water, how much um, salinity is in that water, 
as well as all the living things. So what are the phytoplankton? What types of fish? What type of bacteria? What are the human impacts on that lake? Now, um, you can see that this ecosystem is a bold-faced term, and it's definitely a bold-faced term in your textbook. And just as a rule of thumb, anytime you see a bold-faced term, you should be making a flashcard out of that term. Make that flashcard, make sure you know what they are. On every test, there will be uh, multi-guess questions asking you what terms mean. So just go ahead and start learning those terms. So environmental science is definitely a multifaceted course. Lots of chemistry, lots of sociology, lots of politics, as well as all of the biology and um, ecology studies. And part of the sociology thing that we have to talk about is ethics. You know, what makes things right? What makes things wrong? And when we're dealing with the environment, there are really three basic um, ethical ideas that govern how people think about the environment. If people are anthropocentric, you've probably heard the term um, anthropology and know that anthropology is the study of people. So anthropocentric ethics is somebody that thinks that people are the center of everything. So the environment exists for people. What can I get out of this? This lake is important because I get drinking water from it. This lake is important because I can go fishing on the weekend. Um, deer are important because I can shoot and eat them. That's a very anthropocentric viewpoint. Biocentric viewpoints Bio means life, so biocentric, life-centered. Um, they think that life is important. So a biocentric viewpoint would say that wolves are important because wolves have a right to exist. Wolves are on the planet. They have equal rights as you and your children, equal rights of you and your livestock. We should protect wolves because they are wolves. And the third one, that would be ecocentric, eco, ecosystem, so it's more of an ecosystem viewpoint. It's a little bit between the two of them. Um, ecocentric would say on our wolf example that wolves should exist, they have a right to exist, but not just because they're there, but because they help the ecosystem. So, um, if you've read the textbook, you'll remember that wolves uh, eat coyotes, and by eating coyotes, they push down the number of coyotes in the environment. And having less coyotes mean that uh, more rabbits can survive, and therefore we get a change in the ecosystem. The ecosystem is the way it is because wolves exist, and therefore wolves have a right because that's what's maintaining the ecosystem. And there may be benefits for us in that um, we can then collect the rabbits, hunt the rabbits, and eat the rabbits. So it's a little bit of, of a, a slightly more rounded viewpoint. It's not the ecosystem is only for human benefit, but it doesn't remove human benefit at the same time. So um, ecocentric is a little bit more centrist in its viewpoint. Uh, uh, Anthropocentric, we would say, would be very right-wing in its viewpoint, and then biocentric, would say, would be very left-wing in its viewpoint. And what we've got to try and do in our class is try and make sure that um, we really understand that we are humans, and we have to try and manage the world around us for the benefit of the most things possible. We have to have a benefit for our children and our children's children. And we also have to benefit the organisms that are out there that allow us to live. So we're going to take more of an ecocentric viewpoint and see how we can work with our society to prolong the existence of humans on our planet. Now as we do that, what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, three different environmental attitudes. Development, preservation and conservation. Now, development is a very anthropocentric viewpoint. Remember, anthropocentric, human-centered. So, um, it says that we should develop the living world because that's what benefits humans the most. A uh, good example of this is happening in Georgia right now, 
we have an island off the state of Georgia called Jekyll Island. It is a state-owned uh, island. It's a state park. And there's debate whether we should develop it. Put in huge hotels, um, big parking lots, tons of beach access, uh, put in the casino type things. And undoubtedly, more people would be able to go to Jekyll Island than can presently go with a very few limited number of hotels. The, uh, the opposite of that would be that the, uh, just going to Jekyll Island would be completely changed. You would no longer be going to an island that is very natural in its condition, with large amounts of wildlife, with very natural looking beaches, with salt marshes and dunes that are not trampled. So if you changed it and did that development approach, more people would go, but they wouldn't get the same experience. It would definitely change the experience of going to the shore. Is it wrong? Um, that's why this is called ethics. There is no definite right or wrong. You might decide that, yes, uh, that's what we want. We want to go to a shore when I can easily get showered when I've finished with the water. I don't have to walk through bug-infested swamp. I can just go down a concrete path right to my car. Um, but do you want to do that for every single place in Georgia, in our state? Or should we have some beaches that are developed and some beaches that are less developed, underdeveloped, so that people can decide where they want to go. That's a choice that you're going to have to make during the course. Preservation is the other extreme. Preservation is keeping things exactly as they are now. Uh, not allowing change. If you think about the um, National Archives, they try and do preservation of documents. So they're going to take the Declaration of Independence and try and preserve it, do preservation, so it will last hundreds and hundreds of, of years. It will not change. So a preservation approach to an ecosystem would be to stop it from changing. Now this does have problems. Um, if you think of a normal lake and you read the book, there's a section on succession. Succession is an ecological theory that reminds us the world is always changing. It does not stay the same. At one point there's dinosaurs, there's no dinosaurs now. At one point we're in an ice age, we're not in an ice age now. The world changes. So if you're doing preservation, at which point are you no longer doing what's natural? You're changing the natural environment to keep it the way that you think it should be. Um, a nice example of that. If you have a small pond, say a four acre pond, over time naturally that pond would accumulate sediment, it would accumulate mud and sand and silt, and over time it would naturally fill up. And as it starts to fill up it would change from lake to swamp, from swamp to grassland, from grassland to forest, and it would just change in that natural order. It would succeed through those natural phases. Succession would occur. Now if you're doing preservation, you're going to try and keep it a swamp, or keep it a lake, or keep it a grassland. You've got to preserve it. You've said, this is how we want it, we're going to keep it like this. Um, so who's to say that's how it should be? Who's to say that it is a lake? If we're talking about one here where Georgia Military College is, um, if we go just south of here, at one time all of that area of Georgia was underwater. It was the bottom of the ocean. So preserving it as a lake um, seems odd if the world is then going to change and make it the bottom of the lake, a bottom of an ocean. Um, just an odd system. And our third one, conservation. And again, this is sort of the middle ground one, trying to be a little bit more balanced. Conservation says that um, we're going to really let nature take its course. Right? We're going to try and not use it up and destroy ecosystems, but we are going to understand that ecosystems do change over time and that humans have to be able to use ecosystems. Um, we can't eat without using up plants and animals. That's what we eat. So conservation would be a way of allowing the world to change. We take the lake example, allowing it to change into 
a swamp, allowing it to change into a grassland and then allowing it to become a forest. Just allowing it to progress at the rate of change that's normal. So we wouldn't make the change happen faster by dumping a bunch of sediment in the lake. We wouldn't prevent the change from happening by dredging the lake. We just don't allow nature to take its course. And again, there's a whole bunch of controversy. How fast does nature work? How much sediment should be coming into the lake? Uh, people will argue over that all the time, that this is an unnatural rate. It's just, you know, filling in too fast because people are um, building roads nearby or building houses nearby. Or they'd say it's not filling up fast enough because nobody's allowed to have any development whatsoever. So when we do conservation, we really have to find this sustainable development level. So we're going to make our lifestyle sustainable. Obviously we want our children's 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 children to be able to have breathable air, to find enough water, to have plenty of food, to have enough energy to run their lifestyles. And if we destroy our environment, that won't happen. At the same time, if we don't utilize our environment, then we won't have enough energy and we won't have enough food. So we have to find a sustainable way to utilize the ecosystems around us and maintain a high quality of life for ourselves and future generations. And that leads us to the goal of environmental science. What is the purpose of doing environmental science? And it's pretty simple. It is to produce a sustainable society. So the goal of environmental science is to produce a sustainable society. We are trying to do a society, a group of people living together, interacting together with their natural environment that will last for as long as possible. As long as the sun's shining and the earth's revolving, we want to have people here sustainably. So we can't run out of energy, we can't run out of food, we can't run out of water. We have to utilize all of our environmental resources so that we don't degrade them, we don't run out of them, and we get to use them. Now at the moment, we do not um, survive sustainably in our environment. In the United States, our lifestyle uses up vastly more energy than is sustainable. And we are going to have to face changes so that we can become more sustainable. Now, you probably picked this class already knowing about some of these environmental problems. Um, most people that come in the class pick it because it sounds interesting. You've heard about some problems. So let's look at what the main problems are facing our planet. And there are numerous ones. We have air pollution, whether it's global climate change, uh, often called global warming, or whether it's depletion of our ozone layers, acid rain, and indoor pollutants. We have problems with our biodiversity being depleted. The number of living things on the planet is going down. Some experts say that our rate of extinction is faster presently than it was when the dinosaurs went extinct. Uh, one area of very high extinction is amphibians. The number of amphibians in the world is dropping rapidly and there's no real uh, knowledge of why those amphibians are dying out so fast. We've got food supply problems. Um, not so much in the United States. We have plenty of food, but you can go to countries around the world where there is not enough food for their populations and we're losing soil, we're losing groundwater um, this one is a problem in the US where the amount of groundwater gr water that comes out of wells is being decreased. We've got waste production. What do we do with all of our solid waste, our trash? How do we get rid of our trash? Where do we put it? And how do we do that in a way that won't cause problems for future generations? And of course we've got uh, water pollution problems. Uh, lots and lots of sediment in the water. That's an area that I have done research in. How does all of the sediment in local rivers influence the fish populations? And 
one that we talked about already, oxygen depletion. How can we control the temperature and the amount of oxygen in our local lakes and rivers, keep it high enough to keep high quality fish populations? Now they're just some of it. Um, <coughs> obviously there's many many more problems that are out there. That's just a highlight of some of the things we'll be talking about during the course, if you can call problems highlights. Those are not the number one problem facing the planet though. Our number one problem happens to be the size of the human population. Population size causes problems. If you have a small population, you have very little impact on your environment. A small population of people um, cannot physically produce enough sewage waste to degrade an environment. A small population of people hunting deer cannot physically catch enough deer to have a, uh, an impact on their population. A small population of people using wood for their energy source just physically does not cut down enough trees or generate enough carbon dioxide to have any impact on the temperature of the planet. It is only with a big population that these things will become issues. And as the population gets larger and larger, the impact on the planet occurs faster and faster. So we're just about to get about 7 billion people on the planet. We're almost at the 7 billion level. And that 7 billion people have a massive impact on the planet. So if we have 7 billion people on the planet, um, what's going to happen when we have 8 billion? or 9 billion or 10 billion. One area of the course is to do with population studies and we'll look and see how populations uh, change over time. We'll look and see how large the human population is now and why it is so big compared to how it was uh, 400 years ago. And we'll look and see um, ways that you can control population growth and keep a population that is not growing beyond the means of the environment to support it using current technology. Now one of the problems with a big population is that they produce pollution and you've got to know what pollution is and a couple of different major types of pollution. So what is pollution? Um, when I teach this class face to face, I always ask the students, okay, put your hand up, tell me what pollution is. And they always have a hard time. And yet, um, virtually all of them have used the word pollution in a piece of writing by that point in the course. And I'm sure most of you, as you use population, I'm sorry, have used pollution in uh, your everyday language. You've said it to your friends, oh man, can you believe the pollution coming out of that smokestack? And yet, if asked what is pollution, give me a definition of pollution, students have an extremely hard time doing that. So, that's what we're doing. What is pollution? Um, most people get that pollution has to be something released into the environment that causes harm to a living thing. The problem is, what do we mean by harm? How can you measure harm? If you do something to your lawn, how are you going to know that it's harmed the earthworms? Um, it's easy to tell whether it's harmed a person. You can ask the person questions. But with earthworms, you can't go up to them and say, are you sad? Do you feel less well than you did yesterday? Um, it's very difficult to try and determine when harm has actually happened to an earthworm. So that's where the science comes in. Obviously, if it kills the earthworm, harm has occurred. Our other way of measuring harm would be to look at life expectancy, just how long is it going to live, and how many children are produced. Now, if breeding is impacted, if the earthworms have less offspring, then we can say that harm has occurred. They are not as functional as they were before the pollution event. So we can look at three things. Um, is it killing them? If it's killing them, it's pollution. Is it causing them to die earlier, younger? Then it's pollution. 
and is it decreasing the number of offspring that it's having then that's going to be pollution and there is a term that's used to describe the number of offspring you have the number of offspring an organism has over its lifetime is measured by fitness so when we look at a population a group of animals we can look at their fitness how many offspring are they probably going to have during their lifetime if their fitness level goes down then pollution has occurred if their fitness level doesn't change then pollution is probably not happening right. so that's pollution and then you can see there's two types natural pollution and anthropocentric pollution anthropogenic so anthropocentric anthropogenic that's human centered human produced so anthropology but from humans studying humans so anthropogenic Genic pollution, pollution produced by humans. Anthropocentric pollution, produce, pollution produced by humans. So humans are producing anthropocentric stuff, anthropogenic pollution. So if you're driving your car and you're releasing a bunch of nitrous oxides that'll change into nitric acid and make acid rain, then you've produced anthropogenic pollution. If you are um, burning uh, natural gas and generating carbon monoxide poisoning your next door neighbors then you're producing anthropogenic pollution natural pollution is anything that's not from humans and you gotta remember there are lots of natural pollution sources volcanoes spew out chemicals every day on the planet that are extremely toxic that's nothing to do with people um, even things as simple as rhododendrons produce pollution. Rhododendrons concentrate chemicals in their leaves, so when those leaves fall on the ground, the chemicals are released, and they prevent other plants from growing. They kill other plants. That's definitely a form of natural pollution. They have definitely decreased the fitness of other plants. So if you look at rhododendron trees underneath them, there's really nothing growing. Um, there's another type uh, of plant that does a very similar thing. I grew up originally in the United Kingdom and we had a fern called bracken everywhere. I played as a kid for hours in the bracken, would pull out these long bracken stalks, they grow about four foot tall and they look very like javelins and we'd throw them at one another. There's nothing else there, it's just bracken. And it wasn't until I was in college that I understood why there's nothing else there. It's because bracken um, concentrates cyanide in their tissues and the cyanide, uh, when the bracken dies, is deposited onto the soil surface and kills all the other living things there, uh, making a great place for bracken to live because they have no competitors. Not the best place to have your kids play. Uh, concentrated cyanide, probably not the healthiest for you. So that's natural pollution and anthropogenic pollution. The world of underdevelopment. As we teach this course and learn the information in the course, um, really the hardest thing for students in the United States to understand is that most people on the planet do not behave, live, and think the way that you do. Um, so we have to look at the world as really two separate areas and you can see the area being divided by the blue line here we've got least developed countries or less developed countries and more developed countries so we've got white countries and blue and red countries less developed countries are much poorer than more developed countries they use less resources than more developed countries and their people have less food per day, use less energy per day, you need less water per day. And one thing you need to understand is that more people on the planet live in less developed countries than live in more developed countries. Um, rounding the numbers to make it nice and easy it works out to be about 80% of the world's population lives in less developed countries. 
um, and about 20% therefore live in more developed countries. So about 20% of the world's population live a lifestyle like the average American. You know, people in France, people in the United Kingdom, in Germany, people in Australia and Canada, uh, they all live very like Americans, but they make up about 20% of the world's population. About 80% of the world has very, very little energy use, has very, very little food supply, has very little uh, fresh water supply. So about 80% of the planet live in less developed countries, uh, places like Ethiopia, like Chad, like Somalia. Now, um, obviously those lifestyles are incredibly different. Um, some less developed countries use very little fossil fuel energy. Um, they do a lot of farming still using muscle power, whether it's muscles of people or muscles of draft animals. Whereas in the US we do everything using fossil fuel power, using diesel and gasoline and electricity. So when you look at the impact of an individual, individuals in less developed countries use very little energy and very little resources so they have a very little impact on the planet. So at the bottom of the slide here on the less developed side you can see where it's just got a uh, single set of footprints. But those people have a small footprint, a small impact of that person on the planet. Now compare that to the average American who drives a car, uses a computer often using electricity, watch TV often using electricity, that electricity being made by burning coal or burning oil, um, eating large amounts of food that were produced on farms using automation, so large amounts of diesel and oil being used again, that was trucked to the local supermarket, that kept everything cool on nice air conditioned shelves, so again using large amounts of energy and you can see that that average American has a big impact on the planet and we can see here at the bottom of the slide lots and lots of footprints so the average person having large impact on the planet. Now on this slide it's a very similar viewpoint but a slightly different look. At the top of the slide you can see less developed countries and here's the key fact right here. Most of the people on the world live in less developed countries. 80% about live in less developed countries. So the circle is fairly large. Each one of those people uses very few resources. So each one of those people has a very small environmental impact, very small circles. So each person uses very little and has a small impact but there's lots and lots of people. So add all those less developed people together, you end up with a big impact on the planet. They cut down large numbers of trees, they use up large amounts of soil, they produce large amounts of waste, because there's so many people. Each one, small amount, lots of people equals big impact. Now you look down at the bottom of the slide, you can see more developed countries. The first circle is very small because there's very few people only 20% of the world's population. Each one uses large amounts of resources. Each one has a very large impact. So large impact, large resource use, times by just a few people equals a big impact on the planet. But if you add up the impact between the more developed and less developed countries, if you compare those two, there's really not a lot of difference our small population has about the same impact as the large population living in the less developed world. So we've got a very small population, they have a big population. Um, we do need to look at the ethics of this situation as well as just looking at the impact. We have, in more developed countries, only about 20% of the population. And yet we control about 80% of the world's money. And we control about and use 80% of the world's resources. So we have way more resources 
than a single person in less developed countries. In your lifetime, you will have more money and use more gasoline and more electricity than anybody living in a less developed country. Um, you just have a much larger slice of the world's pie. And you have to think about whether that is ethical. Is it okay for you to use so much more of the world's resources when a child in Ethiopia did not get that option? When a child in the Sudan didn't get that option? When a child in uh, Senegal didn't get that option? Um, one group of people would say, no, it should be equitable. Um, it's very hard to do because the resources are not spread equitably around the world. It doesn't rain the same, it's not the same temperature, so equality is probably not going to happen. Um, some people would say, hey, that's just the look of the draw. I was born in the US and luckily uh, I'm here and I should get to use everything. They have a very anthropocentric viewpoint. Um, no. I'm going to do the best I can for my kids and it doesn't matter about anybody else. And you have to decide where you are in that slide rule of emotions. Do you think that um, you should change your life to allow everybody to be a little bit more well off? Or do you think that you should just provide for your own family and your own children and other people have to make do as they make do? What is, um, without question, is that the human population on the planet is increasing. And the human population is growing very dramatically. And it's not growing fast in more developed countries. The countries with the largest population growth is less developed countries. So those individuals are increasing in number at an extremely fast rate. And yet we're not sharing with them the resources of the planet. Now that's probably not sustainable. Having a very large population that is not provided the same opportunities as a small population breeds an air of hatred. And that hatred can never lead to stability of populations on the planet. So we are definitely going to have to address this. And the, the United States has a very large government body who tries to address this. The United States AID, aid department um, tries to give aid to less developed countries to improve their farming techniques, to improve their medical procedures. It's not like we sit back and don't do anything. Um, but one of the things that's totally true is when times of budget, budget crunches, like now, uh, the first area that everybody says we can uh, cut back on is our aid to less developed countries. Um, so it is a soul searching part of the course and I'm not going to tell you what you should think. Um, I'm not going to grade you because you think one thing highly and grade you down because you think of another thing. Um, all I do want you to be able to do is tell me why you think we should provide aid or tell me why you think we shouldn't provide aid. And these questions will come up when we do our population studies part of the course. Now I said that um, one of the hardest parts of the course here is getting you to understand that people do not think the way that you think. And trying to get you to understand that people may um, think differently than you and that you can't um, complain that they do you can't go around trying to just change what they think but you just have to accept the fact that people like different things than you and think different things than you is definitely one of the hardest parts of the course you know you think I was crazy if I took part of the class to try and tell you that you shouldn't like the color orange because the color orange is just a bad color that's not the way to do it or to tell you that um, you must love jazz music because jazz music is the only style of music you should listen to because it's the only good style of music there is and in the same way um, we really can't dictate to people that this is the way that they must eat or this is the way that you must do your laundry or this is the way that you must teach your children um, in the United States people will have a fit if we're trying to do those same things and we have to understand that those rights spread out to all of the people in the world as well. 
So I'm just going to try and get you to just accept that people think differently than you do. Um, and to embrace the fact that a large amount of variety uh, just improves the quality of life. Variety is the spice of life. So here's a quick story. Um, went on a, a trip to India and uh, I went there with a professor from the London School of Economics and he was rented, hired by the Indian government because they had a problem with poor people uh, and disposal of um, bodies. So in India most of the people when they die are cremated, they're burnt and their religion for most of the population says that if they are cremated and the fire is lit by their eldest son then they will go to heaven. So most people will burn their dead relatives that uses up large amounts of wood lots and lots of energy and if you die on the street as a homeless person with no family who pays for the wood for your fire and their population is growing dramatically uh, India has the fastest growing population on the planet and their homeless people were growing in number dramatically and they physically could not keep up with the number of dead bodies that were being produced. They couldn't pay for all the firewood. So they did the second best thing which was to throw them in the river. They would throw the dead bodies in the river and dispose of them in a river that is considered holy and that would then carry them to heaven. Now the problem then happened as the population continued to grow that they were having too many dead bodies in the river and they were having problems with the dead and decay and clogging pipes so um, what they were doing were importing some snapping turtles and the snapping turtles were designed to add to their ecosystem to, to recycle the bodies faster. Um, not the nicest thing to think about um, and I'm using the story really as a way to show you how people are just different in other parts of the world. So we go over to this area and we stay in a very nice hotel and every day my sheets on my bed are cleaned and I cannot believe how these people can clean their sheets so quickly in an area as poor as this area we were staying. So we follow them to try and find out uh, where they're doing the laundry and this is where they're doing the laundry. So these are sheets from the hotel, and the hotel sheets are being washed in the river, the exact same river where they're throwing their dead bodies, and we're putting snapping turtles to try and get rid of the dead bodies. So the sheets on my bed were being washed in water that was being used to get rid of dead people. That is not something that would be allowed in the United States. That is not something that a normal U.S. citizen um, would think about without feeling queasy and wanting to throw up that was completely acceptable to these people. Right? So you can't say that their religion is wrong, you can't say that their lifestyle is wrong, you can't stay, say that um, what they believe is wrong. You could say that for health standards that would definitely not be the best way to dispose of bodies or the best way to do your laundry. But you can't complain from their religious beliefs. You just have to try and understand that they think differently than you and then how can we explain and make them want to change and the key point there is make them want to change to improve the health of their offspring, the health of their children. And we'll end with one more funny slide. Um, so here's an individual washing his hair in carry urine and over here in Africa cow ur cows are considered um, fairly sacred organisms and cow urine being fairly sterile is seen as a very great thing to wash your hair in again in the US this would be a really big no-no um, if you were going to high school and telling the kids you were washing your hair in cow urine life would become very tough but over here um, where water is extremely rare um, cow urine is a, a resource that they utilize very heavily Again, the example is, is, is one that's funny, but what we're trying to get you to understand is, you know, people in the world don't think like you think. Just because you can watch Fox News or watch CNN or listen to NPR and you're sure that's the way it is, when you travel around the world, people have very different viewpoints than you do. 
and if you're going to understand environmental science you have to open up your mind be exposed to other people's viewpoints and be a little bit of accepting of what those viewpoints are like and that culturally their viewpoint has a right to exist as your viewpoint does you don't have to agree with them you don't have to like what they say but you do have to agree that they do exist and that you and there's not just one way of seeing the world